Sophia's ninth letter. Dear Yaristan, or should I address my letter to poor Yaristan? As I read your letter, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I'm certainly not the one who has any right to pass judgment on you. Thank you for not waiting two weeks to write me. In two weeks, you would have figured everything out. You would have seemed so sure of yourself. And I wouldn't have had the chance to see you as I've never seen you before. Lost, confused, unsure of yourself. I felt much closer to you than I ever had before. For the first time since we've written to each other, you weren't my life's hero, but someone like me, someone who is drifting and waiting, who isn't quite included in the activities of those closest to him. I see now that it makes sense for you and me to be writing to each other. We have much more in common with each other than either of us do with Myrna or Sabina. A few weeks ago, we were so close to something, yet neither of us knew what it was. Now we're both trying to find out what we really wanted, and it isn't easy, is it? I don't think you did very well in your confrontation with Titus Zabron. I had a similar confrontation with Louisa only three days ago, and I think I did much better than you in coming to terms with her and with my own past. She's been at least as much to me as she and Titus were to you. Her independence, her refusal to submit to externally imposed authority, and especially the unity between her beliefs and her behavior have been my life's model. My problem wasn't so much to free myself of my model as to learn why, with such a model before me since my birth, I spent my life drifting. The fault lay in me as much as in her. And that's what you're learning only now. During your second prison term, you reevaluated Louise's stories in the light of Manuel's, and you reexamined her experiences in the light of your two prison terms. But you never reevaluated what you had become along the way thanks to Louise and Titus. You stopped your critique before it was complete. You apparently rejected Louise's contribution to your life, but retained Titus's, and your unconvincing and apologetic defense of Titus shows that you're not willing to carry your critique to its conclusion. I'm somewhat surprised and disappointed by your attitude to Titus. Sabina says you and Yasna are willfully blinding yourselves about him the same way Louisa did. You seem impressed by his admission that the popular army was a mistake. But he's not actually admitting any mistakes. He told you it wasn't that army as such that was a mistake, but the circumstances in which it arose, and working people like Nachalo and Margarita were among those circumstances. In other words, it wasn't his popular army, but the working population that was a mistake. His attitude is almost identical to George Albert's attitude. The population consisted of hotheads, hoodlums, and capable of industrializing themselves. The only difference Sabina or I can see between them is that Albert's special field was technology, whereas Zabron's was politics. That's why Albert's characterized the reactionary population as saboteurs and hooligans who endanger the economy, whereas Zabron characterized them as being animated by instinct instead of a political theory and thus of being dangerous to the all-important political organization. Sabina and I are both anxious to learn what prank Myrna and Yara have in store for you and Yasna. Sabina told me she's learning from them what Margarita Nachalo might have been like if she had lived. Sabina said that Yaristan's virtue is that you never learned what Louisa tried to teach you. You never tried to tamper with Myrna and Yara's lives the way Louisa did with Nachalo's and with yours. Your virtue is that you never became the organizer Louisa tried to turn you into. Consequently, it's all the more surprising that you're so uncritical of Titus. In your second letter to me, you attacked me for my attachment to my key experience and my original community for speaking of opportunists and manipulators as our fellow revolutionaries. Yet what are you and Yasna doing now? Apparently both of you did learn something from Louisa, and you seem unable to undo the effects of the lesson. For both of you, as for Louisa, Titus still expresses the idea of our movement, and he's therefore our comrade and we don't apply the same critical standards to him as we do to enemies, do we? Sabina and I discussed very few of the questions you raised in your letter. One of those questions had to do with Albert's. At one point, Titus told you that at the time of our arrest 20 years ago, the police should not have arrested the entire production crew of the carton plant. Instead, they should have isolated George Albert's position. Read that again and tell me what sense it makes, Sabina told me. As if Albert's views had anything at all to do with the production crew of the carton plant, how can Yaristan be so uncritical? The first connection between Albert's views and the production crew of the carton plant took place after the arrest, when the police accused Yaristan and the others of being Confederates in Albert's spy ring. Sabina convinced me that there was something extremely bizarre about Titus's whole explanation of the carton plant arrests. There was no earthly reason for him to introduce Albert's position into that explanation, because there was no way his views could have affected anyone in the carton plant. During the early part of the war, Alberts apparently worked with the underground resistance organization, Sabina told me. He locked himself into his room with papers. He didn't want me to tell either Louisa or you or anyone else about his coming home with papers. 
he may have been helping smuggle people abroad, or he may already then have been engaged in scientific espionage for the Allied military. I obviously didn't figure out what it was since I was only seven, but I do know the only person who could have known about this activity was Zabrin. A year and a half before the war ended, Alberts told me he had been given an assignment abroad, and I later learned this assignment had something to do with the development of the atomic bomb, though he never told me any details. No one in the carton plant knew anything about it except Zabrin. Luisa didn't learn a thing about his activities until he returned after the war. The production crew that was arrested three years after the war were all hired when Alberts was abroad, except Titus and Yasna, and Yasna never met Alberts, nor was she in any way influenced by his views. I think Zabron is doing exactly the same thing the police did. He's making a scapegoat out of Alberts. He can't accept the fact that his Pygmalion, Yarostad, simply didn't function, and he can't accept the fact that Jan Sedlak, a person Zabron considered an ignorant peasant, made more of an impression on Yarostad than Zabron's theoretical wisdom. He's trying to convince himself that only a theoretician, an intellectual like himself, could have messed up his plans. Not a peasant like Jan, and obviously not Yarostad, an anti-intellectual, undisciplined lumpen on his own. He had expected Yarostan to be disciplined by a few years of work in the carton plant. He thought Louise's influence would turn Yarostan into an organizer, a cadre, with a smattering of theory. Yarostan's combativity was thus to be channeled into what he calls the self-activity of the proletariat, realizing its own historical task. Yarostan was to be something like a controlled natulo. But when the big moment came, Yarostan didn't function. Instead of pulling the base in Zabrin's direction, he pulled Yasna as well as Vera and Adrian in Yan's direction. In other words, the proletariat didn't move the way it was inevitably supposed to move. How was Zabrin to explain this? Certainly not in terms of the fact that Yarostan had remained his own person. Certainly not in terms of the fact that Jan made more sense to Yarostan than Zabrin did. There had to be an outside influence, Albert. If his views had been isolated in time, the production crew wouldn't have been influenced by them. What he failed to tell Yarostan was how and when Albert's views influenced the production crew, and I would have expected Yarostan to have the sense to ask. He did say his head swam as he listened to some of Titus's explanations, I reminded her. I'm not trying to tear into Yarostan, she told me. My head's been swimming, too. The irony of it is that Yarostan helped me clear up things he seems unable to clear up for himself. It was Yarostan who made me see the incompatibility of my friendship with Jan with my commitment to Albert's project. It was he who helped me understand the contradiction between my rebellion against an inhuman social order and my desire to build an inhuman social order with the lowest strata of society. Yet he seemed so mule-headed about his own contradictions, as if he'd suddenly gone deaf and blind. But then I suppose it's that very mule-headedness that made him such a miserable disciple and tool. I'm as bothered as Sabina by your mule-headedness, and I'd like to know what it is that you're defending and why. As I told you when I started this letter, Yarostan, I'm not interested in judging you. I don't have a vantage point from which to do that. I'm trying desperately to understand what's happened to us, why we're again so strange to each other. Only a few weeks ago, you wrote about the possibility of your voyaging here with your Myrna. You even let a tender feeling toward me slip into your letter. Yet now you seem so closed, so defensive, so much like what I'm trying to stop being. You seem to be no stronger than I am. I suppose what upsets me about that is my realization that I can no longer lean on you. Apparently, I still feel the need to. Something very strange has happened since I last wrote you. Ted and I have become very close friends. He's staying with Sabine and me. Tina and Pat still haven't turned up. Ted has moved into Tina's room. It seems so strange, after the horrid things I thought and said about him, for Ted to be sleeping in Tina's room. And yet still more strange. I think I love Ted in a way I've never loved anyone before. A few days after I sent my previous letter, Minnie telephoned to arrange for a time when we could get together. She promised to visit me on the day when she'd help me get out of jail. I told her Ted was in jail and asked her help in getting him out. Ted was released almost as soon as Minnie investigated the case. She learned that the only charge against him was loitering, and that the charge was dropped when she presented herself as his defense lawyer. Sabina waited for him when he was released, and they took a taxi to his place. The print shop looked as if a tornado had gone through it, and Sabina insisted Ted's life would be in danger if he returned there. She's sure the police intend to finish off the printer, whose equipment was used for the production of so many of the radical publications of the strikers. She didn't even let him go upstairs for his personal things. She simply brought him directly to our house. I hadn't seen Ted since he'd driven Pat and me back to the university after our visit to the research center. I must have looked shocked when Sabina walked into the house with him. Do you mind my coming here? was the first thing he asked, standing in the doorway. I grabbed his hand and pulled him into the house. Of course I don't mind, Ted. I hope you don't mind my being here. He smiled sadly and told me he had nowhere else to go and no other friends in the world since both Tina and Tissy had disappeared. Ted quickly learned that Tissy was back in the prison hospital. Sabina had, of course, suspected this, but she hadn't picked up the phone to confirm the fact. 
The day after he moved in with us, Ted went to visit Tissy. He was terribly depressed when he returned. He told me Tissy was convinced she wouldn't ever be released again. She's spoken to him of dying in the hospital, among my only friends. Sabina went to her room and shut her door. She didn't want to learn what Tissy had done after they'd gotten separated at the research center. After the police had cleared everyone out of the research center, Tissy had gotten a ride to the university. She went to the print shop and found it wrecked. There was no sign of Tina or Ted or me. My mind went blank, she told him. She wandered away from the campus and went from bar to bar until she finally found a heroin dealer. She spent the night sleeping on the street until she was picked up by the police. Ted cried while telling me this. I was profoundly moved by his attachment to the beautiful, spiteful urchin who had never had and never would reciprocate his love for her. I felt so sorry for him, so guilty toward him. For two whole days I did nothing but try to make it up to him for my horror behavior in the garage. I was really a blind nitwit when I ran from the university co-op to the garage twelve years ago. I was such a stupefied tourist. It was all so exotic to me. If I had been more sensitive to the people I had moved in with, my past twelve years might not have been as empty as they've been. During the two days after he joined us, I learned more about Ted than I had learned during all the months I had lived in the garage. Sabina had told me some things about him, but I had never been able to piece the fragments together into a picture that made sense to me. His childhood was almost identical to Tissy's. He didn't know who his father was. His mother brought a different man home daily. Ted spent all his days and most of his nights in the streets. When he was 11, he started hanging around a garage where stolen cars were repaired. One night, he was beaten for no reason by one of his mother's boyfriends. He managed to slip into the garage and spend the night there, probably much the same way you found your way into the carton plant. Yes, it's the same garage in which I joined him, Tina, and Sabina years later. When the proprietor found him there the following morning, Ted begged to stay in the garage permanently. The proprietor accepted him, not as a person for whom he felt compassion, but as a potential tool. He taught Ted to open car locks, to hotwire cars, to dismantle them. By the time he was 13, Ted was an experienced car thief and driver, although he obviously didn't have a license. His boss would make him break into the car and start it. The boss could flee if the police arrived, and Ted would be the one who got caught. While telling me this, Ted explained that he would only have gone to reform school, whereas the boss would have gone to prison. This was when he met Tissy. She was ten, fatherless, and equally homeless. Her mother was perpetually drunk and had no use for her. Ted offered her what his boss had offered him, a place to stay and an activity. He also shared his meager income with his new friend. Although Ted didn't quite say it, I gather that Tissy was bored while he worked. She resisted learning what he wanted to teach her, and after a few days with him she spent only her nights in the garage, returning to play in the streets during days. He tried to stimulate her interest in his activity by inviting her to join him on his first attempts to steal a car by himself and in broad daylight. One morning, he and Tissy took a bus to a wealthy suburb, and Ted broke into and drove off with an expensive sports car. Both were immensely proud as he chauffeured Tissy all over the city in a vehicle which probably belonged to a corporation owner's son. This was the escapade Ron had wanted to tell me about when he and Sabina had come to visit me after his release from reform school. Of course, the inevitable police siren stopped the pair of ghetto children one thirteen, the other ten, and both were sent to reform school. Ted for two years, Tissy for half a year. Ted met Ron in reform school. They became friends immediately. Ron, son of the class-conscious Debbie Matthews, patiently explained to Ted that he was being exploited by his boss. The idea of starting a cooperative, non-exploitative garage was Ron's. The project Ron described to Ted in reform school included three other people. Obviously, Ted included Tissy, and Ron mentioned only Jose and me. Sabina had told me this long ago, but I couldn't quite believe it. I still can't. I was to take care of the books as well as the thinking. Ted was released long before Ron, and he didn't believe anything would come of Ron's plans. When he returned to the garage, he found it closed down. His boss had apparently become so dependent on Ted that when he'd been left on his own, he'd gotten caught and sent to a prison for a year. Ted found him when he got out and learned he was giving up the garage. Ted's former boss offered to rent the garage to Ted for an exorbitant sum, and Ted accepted. He wasn't able to bargain. When he asked his boss what had happened to Tissy, the man told Ted, Get yourself another girlfriend, kid. That one ain't for you. Ted didn't understand. He spent hours walking around the neighborhood hoping to find her. He bought himself a suit and a hat, and he did all his stealing at night, mainly from the section of the city where Ron had wrecked his father's car. One night I got back with a new car and there was a lady at the garage door, a woman with a fancy dress, heels, a hairdo, rings, and bracelets. I just couldn't believe it was Tissy. She had just been a kid two years earlier. She said she'd heard the place was my own. No, I told her, I'm just renting. Then she asked, got room for me? I couldn't believe she actually wanted to stay in the garage. Well, I ain't got no other home, she told me. Ted made no demands whatever on Tissy. Her presence in the garage probably excited him, but he seems to have made no advances to her. 
He made it clearer to me that his idea of sexual relations was what he'd seen between his mother and the men she brought home. To Ted, it was equivalent to violence, and he feared every form of violence. Tissy went out almost every evening and she returned long after midnight. She told him she'd taken up a trade she had learned from a girl she met in reform school. Ted had no idea what kind of trade Tissy learned in reform school, but he didn't ask. Late one night, shortly after Tissy had returned for the night, there was a loud knocking on the garage door. Ted opened the door and a wealthy-looking older woman burst in, found Tissy and ran to her shouting, Why did you run away from me, baby? Don't I pay you enough? I'll pay you whatever you ask, baby. Just say how much. Tissy hid behind Ted and begged him to get the woman out of the garage. That was how Ted learned about Tissy's trade, and also about Tissy's sexual interests. Some days later, he asked Tissy, Would you quit your work if I had lots more money? She told him, Yes, I wish I didn't have to do it for money. With other women? Ted asked her. I sure as hell wouldn't do it for free with men, she told him. While telling me this, Ted expressed neither shock nor indignation. That was how Tissy was, and that was how he learned about her, that's all. It wasn't long after this episode that Ron was released from reform school. He and Sabina visited Ted immediately after their visit to me. I asked if Sabina was the girl Ron had told me about in reform school, Ted told me. Ron said no, that girl was miles away. When I told him I was renting the garage, he scolded me for getting myself exploited worse than before. Now the boss does nothing at all and gets paid, he told me. Then he told me about Jose, about this friend of Jose's who could buy the whole garage. I asked why this guy would buy the garage and why he'd let us use it the way Ron saw us using it, cooperatively. He told me about Seth, Dylan, Dope, and needed a steady place. Ron tried to make it sound better by telling me he wouldn't sell Dope from the garage, he just needed a place for making contacts. But I didn't want anything to do with that. That's when Sabina turned me inside out. She said there's no difference between stealing cars and selling dope because you get locked up for both. She knows the difference now, but she didn't then. We were still arguing about it when Tissy came home around midnight. She liked Sabina as soon as she saw her, and I guess it was Tissy who pulled me into going into it with them. She told me she'd quit working if I did what Sabina wanted. Tissy blackmailed him the way she was going to blackmail Sabina later. In the beginning, Ted thought he'd been wrong. The project seemed to be a success. He liked and trusted Jose. They all worked enthusiastically on the transformation of the house behind the garage, and for several months Ted worked with Sabina. He remembered those months fondly. Sabina and I stole together, we dismantled together, we built most of the inside of the house. She's the best person I ever worked with, except Tina. She learned fast, and she told me all kinds of things about machines I didn't know. It was during those months that Sabina and I built the machine shop in the basement, and the lofts upstairs. When I did a painting, she liked it so much that I spent hours every day painting ever since then. But she had a blind spot. She couldn't see the whole thing was no good. It wasn't built by her own hands, but by dope. Seth did his dealing right in the garage. Tissy became a dope addict. The garage became a front. And I became a boss and exploited kids the way Ron had told me I was exploited when I worked for a boss. Those months didn't last. Ron got himself killed in the war. Tissy might as well have gotten herself killed. She became like a dead person. A thing. She became Seth's tool. Jose knew the difference between heroin and stealing. But Jose couldn't argue with Sabina. No one could. Jose got sucked into the idea of the bar because he thought the bar would get the heroin out of the house in the garage. But the bar made everything worse. Tissy took up her trade again, this time with men as well as women. All her money went to Seth, and Sabina stayed blind. After she brought Tina, Seth wanted Tissy to take Tina to the bar. Tissy wanted to teach Tina what she'd learned in reform school. I couldn't take that. Tina liked the garage work. She liked to paint and to make things. I put myself in Tissy's way. That's when Tissy, my first and my best friend, started to hate me. Sabina didn't see any of that. I couldn't talk to anyone there. When the bar started, Sabina convinced Jose it had solved all the problems. That's when you came, Sophie. I was sure you'd be a friend that first night when you returned from the bar and told us you got scared and ran away. But you confused me the next morning when you told Tissy how you'd loved what you'd done the night before. I couldn't know you were ashamed to tell Tissy you hadn't done anything. You started to act funny. The night you went to Tissy's room, I was sure you were on Aaron Seth set you on. I was sure you and Tissy were going to take Tina to the bar that night. I'm sorry, Sophie. Jose thought the same thing I did. It was hard to think anything else. I know, Ted. It was impossible to imagine how abysmally stupid I was to be so surprised by Tissy, to know nothing at all about Sabina, I admitted. But I did learn one detail from Tissy during the day I spent with her at the research center. That night you thought we were acting as Seth's agents and plotting against Tina? That night, Tissy wasn't Seth's agent, and she wasn't interested in Tina. Tissy loved me. Of course, Ted couldn't have known that either. By that night, he distrusted anyone in the garage except Tina. It was only when Alec moved into the garage that I had any friends beside Tina, he told me. Alec understood the difference between dope dealing and all the other things we did. 
All your friends understood the difference, and I guess they made you see it too the last time they came. They opened Jose's eyes too. Not that he was ever blind, but he couldn't make himself go against Sabina. Jose and I became friends after you left. We talked about leaving, but we couldn't leave without Tina, Tissy, or Sabina, and Sabina's whole life was in that bar and garage. I guess that's why Jose got himself arrested. He didn't know how else to get out of it. With Jose gone, Seth thought his chance had come to get Tina into the bar and even on heroin. Jose and I together could have stopped him, but I didn't see how I could do it all alone until Seth himself showed me how. Seth got the idea that Sabina was trying to take over, and when he asked me about that, I told him it was true. I even told him she had plans to get rid of him. Seth was afraid of Sabina. He hadn't ever dealt with her except through Jose. When he got convinced Sabina wanted to get him out of the whole thing, he got so furious he couldn't see straight. He didn't even talk to her. He just pointed his gun at her and told her to get out and take Tina with her. That was what I wanted for years. I would have moved into this house with you if you hadn't felt about me the way you did, and if Tissy had left the garage too. But I couldn't leave Tissy to Seth. To me, she was still the kid who'd asked if I had room for her in the garage. She trusted me. You don't throw someone who trusts you down a sewer, no matter how many excuses you've got. But Tissy was in bad shape after Sabina left. She blamed me for getting rid of Sabina and Tina, and she was right. She really hated me for that. For some reason, she also blamed Jose. She made herself believe Jose wasn't in prison, but had gotten you out of the garage and then Sabina and Tina. Before Jose was released, I rented a place, the same one where Tina and I later started the print shop. I kept hoping Tissy would change. I kept thinking she'd want to move to the new place when Jose was released, or that she'd want to move with you and Tina and Sabina. But Tissy got worse all the time. She started talking about killing me and about killing Jose when he got back, and I wasn't just sure she couldn't do it. Jose came right to the garage the day he was released, got his things, and we both drove to the new place I'd rented. He talked about you a lot, Sophie. He changed a lot, too. We went upstairs. Then he went out to the car to get more of his things, and he never came back. I learned the rest from Sabina a few weeks ago, and I didn't let Ted tell me about Jose's death all over again. How ironic that it should have been I and my academic friends, particularly Hugh, who had finally turned Jose against Sabina. How ironic that Jose should have started to define his struggle in terms identical to Nachalos and Margaritas in response to books I had carried to him in prison. How ironic that Jose should have thought that he had to prove himself as a gorilla in order to live up to me. Only a day or two after my long talks with Ted, from an altogether unexpected source, I learned yet more about the garage and about yet another gorilla fighter who occupied a place in my own life. Minnie came to see me a few days after she helped Ted get out of jail. Lawyer or no lawyer, I couldn't keep myself from throwing my arms around her when she walked into our house. I had always liked Minnie a lot. Ted and Sabina were both out when she came. What have you been doing lately besides getting arrested, she asked me. Damon told me this was the second time you'd been in jail during the past two months. Isn't that enough for a committed revolutionary, I asked. I can't tell you how glad I am that you can still tolerate me, Sophie. You've always fascinated me. My life seems so drab, so uniform compared to yours. When I left you in front of the garage ten years ago, you had gone as low as I could imagine a person going. Then I learned from Damon that you were teaching university courses. Suddenly you turn up fighting hundreds of police in a factory yard. You're an absolute wonder. I'll be grateful to you forever for saying that, Minnie, but I know perfectly well you wouldn't say it if you kept closer watch. If you knew how undecided, how fickle, how dependent I was. That's precisely my point, Sophie. I do know you, much better than you think. I'm also your negative. I'm decisive, consistent, independent and drab, dull, routine, a deadly bore. The most exciting moments in my life were those I spent with a person who had everything in common with you, who could have been your twin. Namely who? None other than Alec. He could no more function without his woman than you could without your man. I was stunned. Are you being sarcastic, Minnie? On the contrary, I envy you, both of you, both equally indecisive, both dependent, both so fickle you continually landed in the most terrible isolation, yet both the most fabulous people in my life. I was wildly in love with him, Sophie. I remained close to him until he was killed. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm fascinated, awed by something I don't understand. Please tell me about him, Minnie. Tell me about yourself, too. I was so used to linking Damon and Minnie, I have a hard time imagining you with Alec. What about your political group? When did you give that up? I've managed to combine it all, Sophie. Law school, politics, and Alec all passed through my life while I remained unchanged. Did Alec turn to you after he left the garage? Earlier, Sophie. He turned to me before he ever moved into the garage. He called me the day he learned you had disappeared from the cooperative dorm. He was absolutely frantic. He was sure you had disappeared in order to shock the people who had kept us off the omission staff. I told him you'd been evicted from the dorm precisely because you'd helped distribute that paper, and the fraternity boys had made a fuss about it and gotten us arrested. He apparently expected me to walk all over the city with him looking for you. I suggested calling your relatives. That was easy. There was only one natural in the phone book. 
but when your mother told us she hadn't heard from you either, I became as frantic as Alec. We visited your mother. She was awfully nice to us, but she wasn't all concerned about your disappearance. She was much more concerned that we kept referring to her as your mother. When we left her house, Alec asked me if I'd go out with him that weekend. He knew that I was about to break up with Damon. Hugh, Damon, and I had all graduated. Hugh and Damon intended to go directly to graduate school. I decided to get a temporary teaching job in a high school instead of going on. We had a big argument about that, but there's no need to go into that. I didn't accept Alec's invitation. I knew I'd be hurt, and I was right. It was on that weekend that you telephoned him, and he forgot all about me and rushed to the garage to see you. He was terribly fickle, but I think he never stopped loving you, Sophie. He called me again right after his first visit to you. He told me excitedly that you had rejoined the working class, and he wanted me to go to his room to learn all the good news. I naively called Damon and Hugh to tell them you'd been found, and all three of us went to Alex. As soon as we walked in, I knew he had expected me to come alone. He pulled me to his kitchen and asked jealously if Damon and I were together again. I lied and told him we were. I sensed his jealousy. Something inside me started to stir, but I didn't let it. I rejected his advances, not out of any consideration for you, but because I didn't want to be your second. I was much too possessive. So Alec told all three of us about what he called your bootstrap operation. Hugh was immensely impressed. I think it was Alec's account of what you were doing in that garage that made Hugh change his mind about enrolling in graduate school. After that meeting, Alec didn't call for several weeks. During those weeks, I waited for him to call. I had never been wanted that way, Sophie. When he finally did call, my heart jumped. But that time, he didn't want me. He wanted the four of us to visit you in the garage. On that first visit to you, I was sure I'd never be anything more to Alec than your second, and I was relieved I hadn't let anything start. I couldn't make any sense out of what you were doing, but Alec was full of enthusiasm for all of it. He quit his job and moved into the garage. I thought he had moved in with you and had definitively walked out on my life. I plunged back into the political activities of my organization. I even saw Damon two or three times outside of organization meetings. And then several weeks after our first visit, Alec called from the garage. He said he had to see me and seemed awfully upset. He told me he hadn't touched you since he'd been in the garage and that he was lonelier than he'd ever been in his life. As soon as he was in my apartment, he kissed me as if we'd been lovers for years, and before saying anything, he started making love to me. I had dreamed of that happening to me ever since I had sensed that he wanted me. I started to let myself go until he stirred up my jealousy with something he said. Oh, Jesus, Minnie, we should have done this years ago, he told me. I angrily asked him, when, Alec? When you were an errand boy for Rhea and her organization? When you were running after Sophie? I told him I had been deeply hurt when my best friends had banned me from the omission staff and I didn't want to be hurt again so soon by Alec, who had nothing to do with that stupid exclusion. I wanted to have at least one friend who hadn't been a bastard toward me. He let go of me right away. He acted as if I unraveled a puzzle for him, and I was once again relieved I hadn't let myself go. I saw that you were all he had on his mind. I was nothing but a temporary consolation. So that's it, the omission staff. Sophie is overreacting again, he exclaimed as if everything were suddenly clear to him. She's expressing her spite against her former friends the same way she expressed it earlier against Lem and Rhea by dating that reactionary asshole Rakshas. He'd been thinking about you all the time his arms had been wrapped around me. I was green with envy. He spent the whole rest of the evening trying to convince me to visit the garage again. I refused at first, but he drew such an awful picture for me. He told me that in response to your exclusion from omissions, you had thrown yourself into a situation which you couldn't survive. He told me all about the heroin and the prostitution. He didn't have to convince me you were too frail to survive that kind of life for very long. He suggested that Hugh, Damon, and I drop in on you, casually as it were, to try to make you grasp what you were doing to yourself, to save you. That was how we were drawn into that terrible confrontation. I thought your sister was such an unscrupulous beast, Sophie. I'm glad that even she finally figured out what you were all doing to yourselves. All my jealousy left me, Sophie. I felt so sorry for you. When you lay on the floor begging Hugh to carry you away, I was sure you were gone. And once outside, you shouted at me to get away from you. You didn't even recognize me. I walked away crying. I didn't walk far. I was sure you returned to the garage, and I waited for Alec. I suppose my jealousy returned when I saw you walking away from the garage, with Alec tagging behind you. All my envy returned when I reached my apartment, alone, and it stayed with me and tortured me for the following two years. I waited and waited for Alec to call but he never did. I had saved you for him. I hope they were happy years for you, Sophie. I spent almost two years with him after that, and those are the happiest years of my life. Minnie, who told you I spent those two years with Alec? I asked her. You don't have to spare my feelings now, Sophie. I'm obviously not jealous now. When he left you, Alec came to me. We loved each other. I saw Alec once, at a distance, a few days after I left the garage, Minnie, and I never saw him again. 
That's impossible, Sophie. He was living at your house when you started seeing me again. My house? I was staying in a dingy downtown hotel, Minnie. I had a job at a fiberglass factory. I never saw Alec again. I hated him when I left the garage. Did he tell you he was with me during those two years? Oh my God, Sophie, no, he never talked about you, and I never asked. He only talked about your mother. I started laughing hysterically. Minnie, Alec must have lived with Louisa for two years, and I had thought she interrupted me. Do you mean to tell me you didn't know? Honestly, Minnie, I moved to a hotel, and later I came to this house with Sabina and Tina. I didn't see Louisa again until last year, and she hasn't told me anything. I should have guessed, Minnie exclaimed. She was so upset when we spoke of you as her daughter that time Alec and I visited her. I could see why. She looked young enough to be your sister, and she was terribly interested in Alec. Already then, Minnie? Right after I was evicted from the co-op? That was the only time I ever visited her. It wasn't I who noticed, Sophie. I'm not that perceptive. It was Alec who noticed. He bowed to her, kissed her hand, praised her house, and made a complete ass out of himself. To me, she was your mother. I couldn't have imagined Alec was going to live with her for two years, so it wasn't because of you that I spent all that time waiting. Is that all you did, Minnie? Wait? Those years must have been similar to mine. I waited for Jose's release from prison. I broke up with Damon once and for all. Why just then, Minnie? Wasn't it then that Damon finally got a job in a factory? Wasn't that what you had wanted him to do after you both graduated? I was surprised when I learned you were close to him, Sophie. I hope this doesn't offend you, but it took me all those years to figure out that Damon was a jerk. Yes, he got a factory job after he got his doctorate in philosophy. And as soon as he started working, he caused a split in the organization. He suddenly became the world's greatest authority on the working class. His former comrades, including me, were suddenly bourgeois intellectuals with no roots in the working class. He started bringing his one recruit to the meetings, a complete ignoramus who got his politics from television sports announcers. Damon insisted on absolute silence whenever his baseball expert felt like making a comment. The meetings became weekly lectures on batting averages, but not for long. There had been eight of us. Three people quit politics altogether. Four of us started getting together at my apartment. Damon and his recruit apparently continued to hold weekly meetings. I wasn't even interested enough to find out what happened to our former meeting place. Alex started attending the meetings at my apartment. He was like a bomb. He finished off what was left of the organization. Alec left Louisa because he became interested in your organization, I asked. Well, in fact, yes and no, Sophie. I ran into him by chance at a major political rally. I hadn't seen him for two years. I saw people there whom I hadn't seen for even longer. Lem Isel was there, too. I even looked for you. Lem and Alec had apparently just seen each other when I saw the two of them. Alec was introducing Lem to your mother. I greeted all three of them as old acquaintances, and that was that. Alec asked me what Damon and I were doing, and I told him I was very involved in the activity of a new political tendency and no longer saw Damon. A few days later, he called. He didn't apologize for having dropped me so completely two years earlier. He didn't express interest in me, but in the organization I had briefly mentioned. He told me he was ready to become seriously involved in political activities. He wanted to do more than attend rallies. He told me he had been reading about the third world and about the ghetto, and that he was sick of just reading about it. I told him when our group met. I also told him I didn't care to have anything to do with him outside the political meetings. And I meant it. I was sure his sudden political commitment was nothing but an act, and I was furious. He started coming regularly to our meetings. He was by far the most dynamic member of the group. I thought you had somehow transformed him. I had never seen him so concentrated, so logical, or so eloquent. He came to four or five meetings and made no advances toward me. But one night he stayed after everyone else left. He told me he wanted to clarify some political questions that were bothering him. I lost my head, Sophie. Alec had been on my mind ever since that evening in his kitchen, when I'd learned he'd wanted me. I don't remember what it was he wanted to know. I don't think I knew even then. I had to consummate what I had interrupted two years earlier. I asked him to stay longer. I talked to him about anything that came to my mind. I wanted to find out if he was still loyal to you, if he'd spend a few hours away from you. I hoped he was still fickle. I no longer cared whether or not I was your second. He stayed. We talked about omissions, about the garage, about heroin, about your mother, about everything and everyone except you. He told me he had retained contact with Ted after he'd left the garage, that Ted as well as Jose had turned against the heroin pusher, and that Jose had been arrested. He also told me how intelligent and well-read your mother was. He seemed surprised that someone who had spent her life working knew so much about so many things. It got very late, and Alec asked if he could stay yet longer. I had been waiting for that question for years. I told him I only had one bed. I had always imagined that your love affairs were filled with animal passion, and I had always envied you, Sophie. Alec moved in with me. 
Our love lasted for almost two years. Those years were sexually the fullest years of my life. Until today, I thought Alex had left you when he moved in with me. And saying these things to you fills me with, with excitement. Please forgive me, Sophie. I'm glad I found you again, Minnie. Please don't stop. I really can't go on, Sophie. In a way, I can understand why you went from Alec to Damon. In spite of his rigidity, Damon was always so considerate, so gentle, and above all, so scrupulously fair. Alec was a monster. He took everything out of me, left me completely drained. I don't just mean sexually, politically, too. Something had happened to him during the two years before he moved in with me. He kept telling me that the train point in his life had been the confrontation he'd had with Sabina the first time he'd visited you in the garage. She had characterized him as a slave to any capitalist who bought him. It obviously wasn't the thought that was new to him, but the beastly way in which she must have said it to him. He told me it was because of Sabina's characterization that he'd quit his job and moved into the garage, and it continued bothering him after he saw through Sabina and her bootstrap operation. He apparently decided that the only meaningful human activity was the total destruction of the capitalist class in all its manifestations, in the colonies as well as the ghettos. That attitude coincided perfectly with our tendency's political program. The fact is that when he started coming to the meetings, he had been drawn to the organization more than to me. That's ironic too, isn't it? He was the only one out of the nine people in the group who had no job. He spent all his time reading and attending meetings. Of course, he automatically became the editor and distributor of the tendency newspaper. Before long, it was Alex's organization. Alex stopped consulting the other members before he made major decisions, and this caused another split. Or rather, the majority of the group purged Alec from making himself a dictator. Only three of the nine stuck with Alec. I, Eric, who is still a friend of mine, and a 16-year-old girl, Carmen, who was connected with the group that eventually destroyed the little that was left. He had met Carmen while distributing the Tendency newspaper. Her brother was one of three rebels who tried to start a radical bookshop in the heart of the ghetto. They were continually harassed by the police. Alec learned that one of the three dealt in dope. He made a scene about it arguing that the radicalizing effect of the books was negated by the dope. Carmen agreed with Alec immediately, and her brother wavered. They were directly affected since they lived right above the bookshop. Carmen started to attend organization meetings. Alec walked her home after the meetings, and he always returned to my apartment. But I had to make a stupid scene. I knew my two years were up. I blew up as soon as he returned one night. I told him I could support him with my teaching job, but I couldn't possibly support his friends. I just went silly. Carmen and her group were completely self-supporting, and the fact that I shared my bed and my meals with Alec had never been a burden to me. Alec rightly interpreted my outburst as a defense of wage labor, and he made that a perfect pretext for ending our relationship. He calmly told me he had experienced similar outbursts before, from his father, whom he'd hated since his boyhood. He acted as if I had evicted him. He packed his little bag righteously and walked out of my life as if we were enemies. Poor Minnie, he did to you what I had done to him the night I left the garage. I spat on him and threw a bottle at him. Did you ever see him again? I never rid myself of him, Sophie, any more than he ever rid himself of you. I think the radical bookshop, the campaign against heroin, and even Carmen herself were all connected in his mind with you. He moved in with Carmen above the bookshop, and he and Carmen continued to attend the organization meetings. Alec took an interest in the bookshop, and he succeeded in getting the heroin dealer out of it. One night, Carmen called me from jail. She, her brother, and Alec had been arrested and charged with being heroin dealers. I went to the trial. Although I knew nothing at all about law then, I knew that trial was an absolute scandal. They were defended by a court-appointed lawyer. Nothing at all was found upstairs or downstairs. One witness testified he had once bought a joint in the bookshop. But the prosecutor ranted and raved about the radical books. He listed one after another title. He read long excerpts about peasants collectively beating or hanging landlords, policemen, and informers. The defense lawyer raised no objections. All three were sentenced to six months without a shred of evidence. When the three of them were released, they attended only one more meeting of the organization. They had prepared a skit before coming. Carmen announced dramatically that the time to talk had ended and the time for action had come. Alex said action meant armed action, and Carmen's brother opened the box they had brought and gave a rifle to everyone in the room. I called them a suicide squad and ran to my room crying. Eric joined them. What would you have done? I would have run to my room crying, Minnie. Do you even have to ask? I had never been so alone in my whole life, Sophie. For the first time since I started college, I was without an organization, without friends, without any activity except that stupid teaching job. I spent my days policing kids and got home exhausted and disgusted with myself. I couldn't stand what I was becoming. That's when I decided to enroll in law school. I know exactly what you think of lawyers, Sophie. I agree completely. I agreed then, too. 
I can't judge you, Minnie. Not anymore. I was drifting back to school around the time you started law school, and I drifted with many less scruples than you must have had. They weren't exactly scruples, Sophie, but something less. I still agreed with Alec. I still thought the only worthwhile activity was to destroy capitalism in any way possible, but I didn't translate that to a practice of chasing down and shooting dope dealers or fighting cops in the street. That kind of activity seemed too much like swatting flies off garbage cans without removing the garbage. But the fact is that I didn't know how to translate my political ideas into any kind of practice. I had almost the same experience with Jose. Maybe the Suicide Squad was our, the only way our commitments could be translated into practice. If so, then I'd become as much of a reformist as Damon. I never wanted to believe that, Sophie. I had always thought some kind of political activity other than suicide, organized activity, could be meaningful and genuinely radical. I never shared Damon's illusion that one could function meaningfully within the system, preaching to future bosses about the revolution at the point of production. But I can't even say that, honestly. I had some illusions when I started law school. I was sick of policing kids. I had been enormously impressed by the foul treatment Alec, Carmen, and her brother had received in court. I told myself my function could be less explicitly a police function. My time could be more my own. And is it less of a police function? You know damn well it isn't, Sophie. I'm part of an enormous apparatus. I'm moved by its rules, not it by mine. My time is less my own now than it ever was before. I started practicing a year and a half ago, about six months before the riot. During the riot, I defended victims of police harassment, illegal entry, illegal arrest, beatings. I found other so-called radical lawyers, and during the cooperative, I'm still with. We worked with a group that called itself a Committee Against Repression. Louisa was on that committee. Really? I never ran into her. I had just barely started that work when I was struck by a blow that incapacitated me for months. I don't think I can tell it without breaking down. It was so awful. Is it about Alec? You don't have to. I do have to, Sophie. I can't go on keeping it locked up inside me, and you're the only person in the world I can share the pain with. Don't make me cry before you even start, Minnie, but please tell me. I want to know. After the meeting when Alec, Carmen, and her brother broke up the organization, Eric moved in with them above the bookshop. Eric was the only one of the group who visited me periodically. They did exactly what they advocated. They constituted themselves into an armed self-defense group. Next time the police would raid the bookshop, they'd have to shoot it out with urban guerrillas, as the four called themselves. They spent a whole year trying to convince people in their neighborhood to arm themselves against what Alec called the occupation forces, by which he meant the police. According to Eric, Alec also kept track of all the heroin dealers in the neighborhood and he paid specific attention to one dealer who supposedly serviced the entire region from a bar protected by the police. They spoke of heroin dealers as rats. When the riot broke out, Alec announced the time had come to rid the neighborhood of all the rats. The bookshop was near the heart of the riot area and was left completely unharmed by the crowds that looted and burned all the shops on both sides of it. All four of them had the impression the revolution had broken out, and they were eager to take part in it. 